You are about to hear a story based on actual events. To protect the innocent, names and places have been changed. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers bring you Mr. Richard Widmark in a story taken from life. Tonight's presentation of... Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents The Hunting of Bob Lee, the true story about the most famous of all Texas feuds, starring Mr. Richard Widmark. Here it comes, folks. Here it comes. You're so right, Johnny Plugcheck. Cold weather is on its way. And now's the time to take your car to your neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealer for a change of oil, grease, some antifreeze. And check those spark plugs, too. Right, Johnny, because the spark plugs are the very heart of your car's ignition system. And when they're right, your chances of starting even in coldest weather are better than ever. If your spark plugs are worn out, Then your Autolite spark plug dealer will install ignition-engineered, resistor-type or standard-type Autolite spark plugs for smoother performance, quick starts, and gas savings. So prepare for cold weather driving now. And check those spark plugs, too. Yes, friends, see your neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealer this week. Just call Western Union by number and ask for Operator 25. She'll quickly tell you the name and location of your nearest Autolite spark plug dealer. And remember, from bumper to tail light... You're always right with Autolite. And now, with The Hunting of Bob Lee and the performance of Mr. Richard Widmark, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. County, June 26, 1868. Editors, Texas News, Bonham, Texas. Gentlemen, if you will permit me the use of your valuable columns, I would like to give you a true statement on what is known as the Pilot Grove difficulty. Notwithstanding that there's been no killing in the village except Dr. Pierce. But to begin, I was raised in this state. I came home from the war a hated man merely because my fortunes had not suffered during the war as had those of my neighbors. And that was the basis for the hatred. I was too prosperous. They used my habit of dressing as an excuse for the first real trouble, for when I rode into the village, into Pilot Grove, I wore a black suit and a hat with a plume in it. It was that hat that started the trouble. They were waiting in front of Nelson's saloon. Hold up, Lee! We want to talk with you. Hold there. Hold, hold stand. Hold. hold there. What do you have to say to me? We want to know who you are to be dressing like that. Are you lording it over us with your fancy suit and a plume in your hat? Why should I lord it over anybody? I dress the way that pleases me. No man would ever wear a hat like that. It's for a woman. I'm wearing it, Evans. We can see that. That makes you worse than a woman. Only one reason you wear it. You think you're better than us. Takes more than a plume to make you better. And I'll see that hat pulled down around your neck. You want to try that, Evans? I'll see it there. You talk mighty brave still up on your horse. Then I'll get down. Oh, stand there, stand there. Whoa. Don't Hold take it. it from him, Evans. Now, Evans, if you or any one of the rest of you think you can tell me how to dress, this is the time to begin. Go ahead, Evans. We're behind you. Don't take it from him, Evans. Shove a hat down his throat. All right, I will. Good boy, Evans. Get him now. You got some dirt on you, Lee. Get him now, Evans. Pull him out! Pull him out! Come on! Pull that boy! Stand there! Stand there! The devil! Look at him! Look at him! 
He's dead, boys. Look at the back of his head. Did you hear that, Lee? I heard. Evans is dead. And you killed him, Lee. He fell under my horse. You knocked him there. Sure you did. It was a fair fight, and I knocked him down. Your sword was that way. You killed him, Lee. And we'll get you for it. He's not the only one who'll die in Pilot Grove. You can remember that, Lee. You'll pay for this. Isn't that right, boys? That's right. right, Dad, there's no sense in my talking to you. You all know it was a fair fight, but you built up a hate. And you'll think what you want to think. So do what you want to do. I'll be waiting. You won't wait long. You, Madison. You can give me back my hat. I want to say this strongly, gentlemen. I did not kill Hugh Evans. Those men knew I didn't, or they would have killed me then. They were all armed, but nobody drew a gun. So I left them on a road back home where my wife and my brother waited for me. Why did you fight, Bob? Why did you let them make you fight? I had to, Corey. I hold still. You shouldn't have, Bob. Now they've got you, Evans, dead. Couldn't help that, Henry. Hold still. It's what they've been waiting for, something like this. Sometimes a man can't sit back. Sometimes it's smarter to. A man can't be insulted in the street and sit back. Now, I'm not a man for trouble. I came home to live in peace. They started this. I've done nothing that I wasn't pushed into. The way they're thinking is you kill one of theirs, now they'll kill you if they can. Then that's what they'll try. There's nothing I can do about the way they're thinking. But I'll wait for it. As this group of men had been known before to raid ranches for profit, I thought they might ride to mine if they were planning retaliation, however groundless. So I prepared accordingly. I sent my three ranch hands to take all the horses, saving two, into hiding a few miles away. And then at nightfall, with lamps unlighted, and with my wife afforded such protection as possible, my brother and I sat down with our rifles at open windows and waited. Now, these might seem to you, gentlemen, unnecessary precautions. But they would not seem so if you knew this band of cutthroats. However, we were relieved some time after when we heard two horses approach the house, saw two men dismount in honesty near the front door. The Union soldiers. What do they want? I don't know. But put your rifle aside. Who is it, Bob? Union soldiers. Why have they come here? We'll find out. Light another lamp, Corey. Evening, men. We're looking for Bob Lee. You found him? I'm Bob Lee. What do you want? I've come to take you to Sherman. I have orders to put you under arrest. Put me under arrest? For the murder of Hugh Evans. That was no murder. It was a fair fight and I knocked him down, but he died by accident. You'll have a chance to say all that to my officers at Sherman. You'll come peaceably, won't you, Lee? Of course I'll come peaceably. Bob. The Union Army is a just army, and I'll be treated fairly, Corey. That's more than I can expect from Boren and Beer and the others. Of course I'll go peaceably. In truth, I was anxious to yield myself to arrest because I knew that by fair trial, no army court could find me guilty of murder. So I surrendered in good faith, believing in right. But I was soon to learn that those two men who took me weaponless from my house were not Union troops at all. They were imposters with forged orders, shaming the uniform. And they turned me over to Boren and ten or a dozen others in Choctaw Bottom, where I was summarily tied to a tree before a fire. You can say what you want, Lee, but you'll be thanking us before we're done here. I'll thank the day that sees the end of you, Boren. And you, Sam Beer and Wilson and Maddox, Lewis Peacock, all of you. Yeah. You might have seen your last one. Did you ever think of that? Are you trying to scare me, Maddox? Because you don't. None of you do. You want to get yourself killed, Lee? Never mind, Maddox. Don't listen to him. 
We brought you here to give you a chance to live. You give me a chance to live? That's what I said. Ask the rest of the boys. Now, what kind of talk is that? To give me a chance to live? You mean you think you hold the right to give anybody a chance to live? You're nothing but filth, all of you. Filth, is he? I say kill him and be done with it. Filth, is he? Now, this isn't the time for talk like that, Lee. Some of the boys would just as soon knock your brains out right now. You don't hear me begging him not to. Give it to him, boys. Get out wait. Wait. We brought him here to give him a chance. Well, get it over with. Now, listen to me, Lee. You want to live, don't you? You got a wife to live for. You're young. Man comes back from a war, he doesn't want to die. Say what you have to say. Blair there has a paper we're asking you to sign. If you don't sign it, we'll kill you here and now. Get in the firelight, Bill, and read it to him. This is what those thieves demanded of me in their note. That I sign over to them a bill of sale upon my ranch. The buildings, the cattle and horses, and all other property that I promised payable on demand $2,000 in gold, and that I and my family leave the state forever. They threatened to kill me if I did not sign, and also to kill me if I failed to meet the demands. So balancing certain death against probable death in the future, I decided to give them my signature. But I forced myself to suffer their beatings and their insults for three long hours so that they'd get no inkling of a plan that was in my mind. Now, after being released, I thought to set about proving the illegality of the note they held and turn the civil law upon the scoundrels. So in the company of my brother the next morning, I rode into Pilot Grove to inquire about legal counsel. Although we still sought peace, we went armed. I with two pistols and a rifle, my brother with two pistols. It so happened that I first stopped for information at Nelson's saloon. And in front of there, I saw one of the men from the night before, Jim Maddox. I didn't notice out there if he was armed, but he was not when he followed us in a few minutes later. There he comes, Bob. I'm unarmed, Lee. I'm not starting to play, Maddox. But if you feel like backing up some of the things you said last night, I'll loan you a gun. I come in to say I was sorry about that. The rest of the boys got me riled up. I sure didn't expect to see you in town this morning. Well, I'm here. I came in to prove that note I signed isn't worth anything. Be quiet, Bob. And you can tell Boren and the others that if you've got enough brains to understand. That note wasn't my idea, Lee. I didn't have nothing to do with it. Then we've got nothing to talk about. Goodbye. You talk too much, Bob. I can't be driven by anybody. This isn't a time for pride. You got to let them know. First chance you get, you came out on top last night. That's wrong, Bob. Maddox will get the born before... They wanted me to... Without a chance to draw, Maddox? That's no... <laughs> Bob. Bob. What'd he do, Bob? What'd he do? Wake up, wake up, darling Corey. And go. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Richard Widmark in The Hunting of Bob Lee. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills... Suspense. Folks, winterize right now. Please do. And check those important spark plugs, too. That's potent and pertinent patter, Johnny Plugcheck. Cold weather is coming fast, and it's not a bit too soon to have the oil and grease changed. Antifreeze put in. And check those spark plugs, too. Right, Johnny, because when they're right, your chances of starting, even in coldest weather, are better than ever. So visit your Autolite spark plug dealer. His exclusive Autolite plug check indicator will instantly show you if your spark plugs are right for the cold, driving days ahead. If cleaning or adjustments are needed, he has the latest equipment to do the job quickly. 
If replacements are needed, he has resistor type or standard type Autolite spark plugs. They're ignition engineered for smoother performance, quick starts, and gas savings. And used as original factory equipment on many leading makes of our finest cars, trucks, and tractors. So plan now to have your car winterized this week. And remember... Check those spark plugs, too. Be sure. See your neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealer because from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Richard Whitmark in Elliot Lewis's production of The Hunting of Bob Lee, a dramatic report well calculated to keep you in... Suspense! Frighten you, gentlemen, is the truth. It was a cold-blooded shooting. The bullet entered one side of my face, tearing my cheek and breaking my jawbone. Came out on the other side of my head, just in front of my ear. Maddox left me for dead. And well, I might be, had it not been for the timely aid and skill of the late Dr. Pierce, who I mentioned at the beginning. I may add here that this excellent person, later who nursed me in his own home, was later killed by this gang. He was murdered in the presence of his family for the reason that he saved my life. In time, I was well enough to return to my ranch. But my face will always be twisted by scars. My cattle had been stolen. One of my hands had been killed. And the other two, frightened, had sought work elsewhere. The difficulty had become a true feud. My wife had been removed to safety in Hunt County, and I was forced to take up arms myself. I'll stand with you, whatever you say, Bob. We can't be hounded anymore. I don't see how it'll get any worse. Except for one thing, Henry. Once we start out, we can't come back here. There's nothing to stay for anyway. All right, then. We'll pack some food and blankets right out late this afternoon. It's sure the ranch is being watched, so we'll ride north as though we're leaving. Then tonight, when we're clear, we'll cross over the blackjack, come back the other way. Where to, Bob? I made a list, Henry. And I put Jim Maddox at the top. Under him, there's Sam Beer and William Dixon and Israel Boren and Lewis Peacock. It was at this time that my brother and I were first called outlaws. That is not now nor never was true. All we wanted was peace, and there was no law and order. We never killed an unarmed man, or never without giving a man a chance. Why, that first night when we got to the Maddox shack, he was alone there with his guns hung up. We could have killed him through the window. This is far enough. I want to go in alone. I can see how you would. Yeah, but he might remember my voice. If you knock on his door, and if he asks, you tell him you're John Baldock, that born sent you. All right, Bob. Step to the side when he opens. Who's there? John Baldock. Boren sent me. All right. Hey, what? I've come to clear it up with you and me, Maddox. Uh, I'm not armed. You said that before. You'll put your gun on. What if I won't? Then I'll kill you where you stand. Put it on, you'll have a chance to draw. You don't have to watch me. Turn around. Buckle your gun on. Turn around so you can see where it is. It's all right. He tried to draw from where it was hanging. I think this is a night we'll remember, Henry. 
Sam Beers next on the list. Then we moved into Jernigan's thicket for safety because Boren and Peacock and the others had enlisted aid from Kansas. Some 30 strong, we were told, hired killers. So we were forced to move by night. All right, Henry. I'm all right. I look for him on the right side, you on the left. We'll go in there. Bob, there. Move farther down while we can. They see us now. Sam Beer, William Dixon. The Lee brothers have come to clear it up with you and us. What do you want, Lee? We want you to stand up from your table and start a play so we won't have to kill you sitting there. They're going to dump the table. What are you going to do? Back to the door. You've heard what the Lees have had from these men. If they have any friends here, this is the time to speak up. <laughs> One day about 12 after that, when my brother and I returned from hunting to the shack in Jernigan's thicket, we were surprised to see Israel Boren waiting for us, unarmed and with his hands in the air. What does he want? Hold back, boys. You can see I came in peace. Then leave in peace, Boren. Whoa there. Hold, hold. Stand, stand. Boy. Leave Boren and come back wearing your gun. No. Wait, I came in peace. Whoa there. You've got no right to come in peace. Bob, can't we hear what... Henry! <laughs> My brother was killed there in the thicket by rifles hidden in the brush. Boren and his hired gunman took advantage of the fact that we always gave our enemies a chance and lured us in with an unarmed man. I killed Israel Boren after that, and I looked for Peacock, but I couldn't find him. And then I learned he put a thousand dollars on my head. And more gunmen came to hunt me from Kansas. I moved to Gibson Thicket, then to Thatcher. And there were so many men I could hardly move at all. And then finally, after three months, although I'd vowed that I'd die before I ran, I left the county and rode to see my wife. Oh, Bob, what have they done? What have they done so that we can't be man and wife and live the way we want to live? It's finished now. I've seen my brother killed and I've avenged him. I've done what I can. I can't do any more. There are things to do. There are places we can go. We started in Fan County. We can start someplace else. Yes. Yes, yes, we can. But I've uh, I've one more thing I have to do, Carrie. I write a letter about this trouble we've had to the newspaper in Bonham. When the people read it, they'll know the truth. That I'm not a criminal. That I wanted peace. And I couldn't have it. And so I say in conclusion that I have done what I can to procure peace. I have been driven farther than most men, I think. And any violence I have done has been justified. And finally... I am still willing to surrender myself to any impartial civil authority at any time, since I know I am right. I'm sorry to take so much of your valuable time in your newspaper space, but a great many people have no idea of the true origin of all this trouble. I remain yours, Robert Lee. There's no danger here, Bob. 
Are you sure? If Peacock had followed, I'd have known. I'm sure, Corey. I'll post the letter. Be back in 30 minutes. Then we can talk about where we'll go. <laughs> well, after four months, Corey, I, I think there should be much to talk about. Oh, Bob. You wait in the house. Please hurry. I will. You go inside. Come on, boy. Come on. A true story of the Old West, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Richard Widmark. That was a powerful story, Richard Widmark, a Western drama we'll remember for a long time. Thanks, Harlow. I really enjoyed playing Bob Lee. And may I thank the other members of the cast for their wonderful support. They were a great team. Hmm. Reminds me of the Autolite team, Dick, working together for better performance. Yes, I see what you mean. Yes, Autolite makes over 400 products for cars, trucks, tractors, planes, and boats. And they're engineered to work together perfectly. Autolite makes a complete line of ignition-engineered spark plugs, both standard and resistor types. Autolite batteries, including the famous Autolite Stay Full. In fact, Autolite makes complete electrical systems. No wonder, from bumper to tail light. You're always right with Autolite. Next week on Suspense, our star will be Mr. Joseph Cotton, as a man who, in a most unusual fashion, tried to clear himself of the suspicion of murder. A dramatic report we call The Trials of Thomas Shaw. In weeks to come, we shall also present Mr. John Hodiak, Mr. John Lund, and Mr. Frank Lovejoy, all on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morwick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Miss Terry Lee was the ballad singer. The Hunting of Bob Lee was based on the book by C.L. Sonicson and was adapted for Suspense by Gil Dowd. Featured in tonight's cast were Kathy Lewis, Lou Krugman, Junius Matthews, William Conrad, Harry Bartell, Byron Kane, and Joseph Kearns. Tonight's appearance of Mr. Widmark was made possible through the kind permission of 20th Century Fox Studios, whose current release is The Desert Fox, starring James Mason. And remember, next week on Suspense, Mr. Joseph Cotton, in another story based on actual events, a dramatic report we call The Trials of Thomas Shaw. For the location of your nearest Autolite spark plug or battery dealer, or your nearest authorized Autolite service station, phone Western Union by number and ask for Operator 25. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is the CBS Radio Network.